Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desire is known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. God be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring ruin to the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read Psalm 113 together, responsorially. Hallelujah. Give praise, you servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be blessed from this time forth forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, let the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who sits enthroned on high, but stoops to behold the heavens and the earth? He takes up the weak out of the dust, and lifts up the poor from the ashes. He 
sets them with the princes, with the princes of his people. He makes the woman of the childless house to be a joyful mother of children. A reading from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing together the sequence hymn, hymn 368. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, 
and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager, because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Gospel of the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with the flame of your love. Amen. Amen. You know, the parables of Jesus are sometimes straightforward and easy to understand. <laughs> and then there are those parables that leave preachers and congregations scratching their heads and wondering what exactly Jesus wants us to take home from this story. This morning's puzzle is, as you may have noticed, Jesus commends the behavior of a manager who finagles his way out of a mess. If it's ever okay for a preacher to stand before the congregation and say, I really don't know what's going on in this passage, that's today. <laughs> the way Jesus tells the story, charges were brought to the landowner about the manager. But what if someone who had it in for the manager made up the charges and then laid them at the feet of the owner? That's happened before, right? We've seen trumped up charges before that have no basis in truth. Haven't we? I wish we could rehabilitate this manager, dishonest or not. But maybe there's something much more basic. And I realize I skipped the second page and I was wondering why that didn't make sense. Let's go back. Let's go back. So we've, we've said, what, what does this passage really mean? And then, if the gospel had only included the final four verses and left out the parable, we'd be good to go. Those last four verses are a series of Jesus sayings strung together by Luke as a commentary on how we spend our money. Kevin will be glad I didn't leave this part out. Here at St. Francis, we're trying to wrap up the stewardship season, 
And Gretchen and I have turned our pledge card in today a little late, I will tell you that, but those last four verses without the perplexing parable would have made it easy for me to talk with you about how generous God is, inviting us to be generous and wise givers, pass out the pledge cards to other stragglers like us, have communion together and get on with the picnic. But we still have this parable and it isn't going anywhere. We know this central character in today's parable as the dishonest manager. I have to tell you, I get suspicious when labels are slapped on people, even characters in a story. Do they really describe the person accurately? So I wonder, was this manager actually dishonest in the management of the owner's property? And then, this part you've already heard, the way Jesus tells the story, charges were brought against the landowner and the manager. And what if somebody came to the manager and with made-up charges? And I wish we could rehabilitate the dis this dishonest manager, but there is something more basic. It's hard enough to hear the rich owner, the man's boss who had perhaps been cheated out of some money, praise his employees for being so clever and shrewd when we expected judgment. But it's even more problematical when the parable ends and Jesus speaks directly to his disciples. He says, And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into their eternal homes. What on earth is Jesus talking about? Don't we say that you can't buy friendship? And here's Jesus telling us that yes, sometimes you can make friends not only with money, but ill-gotten money. It just doesn't make sense. It's outrageous and bewildering, except that's exactly the way parables work. We listen along, thinking we understand where the story's going, certain about who the good guys are and who the bad, who are the bad, and then something happens that reverses the course, catches us completely off guard. Something happens like a questionable manager, perhaps dishonest, perhaps just street smart, becoming one of the heroes. Think about it. Who are the people Jesus would have us pay attention to? whose lives become vehicles for God's grace. Here's someone we expect to scorn, one we expect to be punished for shady behavior, his ambiguous business dealing. And yet he's more complicated than that. He acts cleverly, but he does act. What if we came up with another name for him, Frederick Borsch of blessed memory in his book, Many Things in Parables, calls him, instead of a dishonest, dishonest steward and dishonest manager, suggests we call him the resilient rascal. <laughs> Even after disaster has struck, our resilient rascal carries on, and he demonstrates faith and strength. And maybe it is in that response Jesus finds something worthy of commendation and forgiveness. Grace does come to us, come and through to us, very, through very unlikely people. A prodigal son who wastes his father's generous gifts. A tax collector. Prostitutes. That Samaritan we call good. A rich man dressed in a fine purple outfit and a poor man whose wounds were licked by dogs. Come back next Sunday for that story. And finally, grace even comes through the lives of those disloyal, unsteady disciples. They are the ones Jesus chooses to hang out with. They are the ones Jesus holds in the light for us to see and invites us to consider as delightfully surprising examples of grace. So how might we participate in sharing God's grace as people who share some things in common with the resilient rascal? 
We who have cut corners, said unkind things to neighbors, co-workers, friends, broken promises, and still live with the certainty that we are loved and forgiven. Here's a story by the extraordinary poet Naomi Shihab Nye. Some of you may know it. Uh, she is the daughter of a Palestinian refugee father and a Swiss-German mother. It's a story about grace appearing out of nowhere. It's a story about grace coming through the lives of unlikely people. It's called Gate A4. Wandering around the Albuquerque airport terminal after learning my flight had been delayed four hours, I heard an announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of gate A4 understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate A4 was my own gate. I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing, help, said the flight attendant. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late, and she did this. <coughs> I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke haltingly. Shudawa, shubiluk habiti, stani shwa, min fadlik, shubit sevi. The minute she heard any words she knew, However poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, no, we're fine. You'll get there just late. Who is picking you up? Let's call him. We called her son. I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother till we got on the plane. She talked to him. Then we called her other sons, just for the fun of it. <laughs> then we called my dad, and he and she spoke for a while in Arabic and found out, of course, they had ten shared friends. <laughs> then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? <laughs> this all took up two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling about her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She had pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts from her bag and was offering them to all the women at the gate. <laughs> to my amazement, not a single traveler declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo. We were all covered with the same powdered sugar <laughs> and smiling. There is no better cookie. Then the airline broke out free apple juice and two little girls from our flight ran around serving it and they were covered with powdered sugar too. <laughs> and I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag, some medicinal thing with green furry leaves. Such an old country traveling tradition. Always carry a plant. Always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones and thought, this is the world I want to live in. The shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying of confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all those other women, too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. So what do you think? 
Would Jesus have told this story to his disciples as one more example of being awake to the possibility of finding grace in unlikely places and pouring from the hearts of surprising people? Do you suppose even he might have told it to them on that night they shared supper together for the last time? invite you to stand as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from love, light from life. True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. prayers of the people. Brothers and sisters, I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. Let us pray, saying we bless your name, O Lord, from this time forth forevermore. We make our prayers for all church leaders. May all those called to be heralds and apostles serve you, the church and the world in all godliness and dignity. We bless your name, O Lord. From this time forth forevermore. We make our prayers for kings and all who are in high positions. May they make laws that protect the poor and promote justice, set their hearts on truth. We bless your name, O Lord. From this time forth forevermore. O God, you created the heavens and the earth Give us the courage and diligence to care for your creation. Grant us to live at peace and harmony with all the works of your hands. We bless your name, O Lord. From this time forth forevermore. God, we have had more than enough of violence and bloodshed. So let your compassion be swift to meet us. Help us, O God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive us our sins for your name's sake. We bless your name, O Lord. From the Son, We pray for the poor, the needy, and the sick, especially Amelia, Andrea, Bob Andretti, Art, Arthur, Father Brent, Mary Boyd, Marie Bissell, Connie Bridges, Bill Casale, Christina, Cynthia, Newt Curtis, Diana Dumond, Edward Dufresne, Charles Farinelli, Brent Fallweiler, Jiffy Fall, Bill Gould, Brinley Hall, Catherine Husted, Jill Kaler, Kira and John Klinger, Keegan, Alex Kirkpatrick, 
Joanne Creston, Michelle Liberty, Lisa Look, Fred Marston, Lorelai McKinnon, Mary Newton, Sophia Partridge, Susan Reddy, Roland, Ronan, Rhea, Donnie Smith, Marshall Smith, Peggy Smith, Fred Stein, Carolyn Taylor, Judy Thomas, Tom, Holly Whalen, and Persis Williams. We bless your name, O Lord. From this time forth, forevermore. We make our prayers for all who have died, especially Kyle Sennett. We thank you that you sent Christ to Jesus to humankind and that through him, everyone might come to the knowledge of your eternal salvation. We bless your name, O Lord. From this time forth, forevermore. We remember those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Emma Brown, Joanne Creston, Sally Falk, and Anne Cassatt. We bless your name, O Lord. From this time forth, forevermore. We pray for those who serve in the armed services, especially Abigail, Kyle Carino Mings, and Kevin West. We bless your name, O Lord. From this time forth, forevermore. Most high God, your ways are not our ways, yet your ways bear life. Hear the petitions of your assembled people. Pour out on your world the faith to hear your call and the courage to answer it. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who is one with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done in our life. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with Francis and Claire and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory. Thank you. 
worthy of Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The gifts of God for the people of God. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 Standing, let us pray together the post communion prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness. Peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you this day and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Thank you, Alan, for being with us today, and he'll be here next week as well. Um, I think you performed magic with that gospel today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to offer an update on Father Brent's health. Um, he, he went up to Bangor this week to um, get some shots in, in the nerves of his neck and um, had a reaction to the procedure. So he will, <laughs> if it can go wrong, it will with him. But um, he will have this procedure in a couple of weeks with sedation. So, so that should be a better approach for him. He sends his very best to everybody. Um, the picnic today is, is especially to honor those wonderful supply priests who have just kept us afloat for so many months. We just so appreciate each and every one of you, and each and every one of you bring, has brought a unique gift to St. Francis. So um, thank you, and, and thank you for being here today. Bill has a couple of words, Bill Gould, for stewardship. And I just wanted to mention that um, John Paul and I will be away for a week starting on Tuesday. So Prudy is the point person for the next, from the 20th to the 27th. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful process of aging is wearing hearing aids. It even gets more complicated when you're wearing hearing aids with a mask. Um, so I have a couple words to want to give you about stewardship, uh, my faith journey, and the life of this church. So first to start with, um, I heard the Queen have once said that uh, that love, the grief is the price of love. Uh, my sense is, and God bless the Queen, uh, is that stewardship is the price of Christianity. You can't have Christianity without stewardship, and stewardship you can't, is the key essence of Christianity. Um, and we mean by stewardship, it's more than uh, this physical building. I am the, uh, the vestry representative of the Buildings and Grounds Committee, and we've done an exceptional job keeping this facility uh, in the kind of shape that it's in, and we're really proud of it. But stewardship is the outward expression of our faith. 
In my sense of faith, faith is not faith without action. And one of the essential pieces of faith action is stewardship. And by stewardship, we mean our money, our time, our energy, our faith, and, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. That's what is the important part of stewardship. Thinking about St. Francis, uh, thinking of everything that we've had to live through in the last three years, it's amazing that this congregation is held together. We've gone through COVID, we've gone through Brett's illness, we've gone through a myriad of other challenges. And um, one of the things I'm most proud of in my life has been asked twice to be a vestry member at this church. So how did I get here? So it's an interesting story. So um, before we came to Maine, uh, I was at uh, St. John's Episcopal Church in Ellicott City, Maryland, which is the largest parish in the Diocese of Maryland. Uh, the Bishop Emeritus um, who, uh, uh, our church, who was the uh, deputy bishop for the Diocese of Maryland, became the Bishop Emeritus of the Church. And he gave a sermon one Sunday morning. And I always remember this sermon. And one of the th- I was going through a really tough time at church. And one of the things he said, sometimes God wants you to be in the place you don't want to be. And when I think about uh, St. Francis, I, this, we ended up in Maine because my father-in-law passed away six years ago. And my mother-in-law had a stroke. And my wife wanted to be near, uh, near to my mother. And, and the house next door was for sale. And so we, we came up one weekend to uh, kind of check things out. And as it was, I went to St. John's, uh, excuse me, St. Francis Fair, and who should I meet? John Paul. We actually bought a table from John Paul. And John, and JP said, Bill, why don't you come to this church? So I come to church the, the, uh, the um, next week. And um, interesting enough, when I walked in here, I said, maybe I made a wrong turn. Uh, I think this is the Quaker meeting house, not an official <laughs> church. <laughs> so, so I kind of hung in there a little bit, and because uh, uh, I'm used to the, I, uh, so I come through Christianity from birth. My grandfather was an Episcopal priest in one, one of the uh, one of the second largest uh, at the time, even though it was the fact excuse me, de facto segregation in the Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. Uh, this was predominantly uh, African-American church, and um, my grandfather was the, uh, was the minister there. And um, as it was, I, at five years old, I became the youngest Chief Chris- Christopher in the history of <laughs> God. So, uh, so I've been in Episcopal since uh, birth. Uh, kind of wandered through the Presbyterian Church in my first marriage, but I came back to, to the Episcopal Church, and I'm so glad I did. Um, and so with that, with that start uh, of my faith journey, which has been a journey, uh, I think one of the, one of the prices of, hum, of humanity is making mistakes. <laughs> you know, we all make mistakes, and I've had a very, very complicated um, and interesting faith journey. Um, the, um, so, you know, why do we give? We give because not only does it make us feel good, we give because it's important for the life of this church, this community that we reside in, and the world that we live in. Stewardship is a key ingredient in that. Um, I kind of think about how I come to Christianity, um, and listening to my, I was able, my, my grandfather, died at seven, uh, but I still remember some of his connection, and I still, at points in my life, relate back. He still is my, my guardian angel. Uh, but one of the things I remember the first time I heard the Sermon on the Mount, and it actually created my sense of stewardship, and the line that was most powerful to me was that the meek shall inherit the earth. And that was one of the reasons I ended up in profession. I, I ended up in, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a social worker. Uh, not an individual caseworker. I'm one of the radical. Uh, I was a community organizer um, at school. Uh, 
Barack Obama and I had two things in common. He was a community organizer, and he's a mixed race. I'm a community organizer, and I'm a mixed race. So I had that in common with our former president. Um, so I think, you know, I just wanted to kind of leave, leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, the, the future for St. Francis is strong. The fact that we've been able to survive these things and we prosper, we bring new members in, is exciting. The fact that uh, I'm so proud to have been uh, honored to have been asked to be a member of the vestry twice in this, in, this, uh, in this wonderful place that we worship in. It was really funny when I left the uh, church. I had just gotten off a tour of duty uh, as a vestry member in uh, my church in, uh, in Maryland. And one of the first things they said to me, I bet within a year I'll be back on the vestry. <laughs> it worked out. Um, uh, I've kind of been in a leadership position in churches before. Uh, at my home church in uh, Bridgeton, New Jersey, in South Jersey, I was the head acolyte. So it just seems like I kind of get keep getting stuck with these leader, leadership positions. But I, I hope it's because um, some of the things that I, I have to say sometimes uh, have an impact on people. Um, I can't tell you how much I love all of you. I love this place. Uh, when I, when um, I wrote the little card out to um, Claudia about contacting me, one of the things she asked me when she called me is, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a new home. Mm -hmm. And this has been uh, my home for almost the last five years. And I'm so glad that I walked through the door and didn't walk back out when I thought I was at the uh, French meeting house. <laughs> so one last thought is one of my favorite prayers, and I think it's very befitting of um, today, is uh, you know, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. It's a little prayer I say to myself almost every day. And I think let's all remember, you know, we fought the good fight, we finished the race, and we kept the faith. And stewardship is a key part of our faith. Thank you for letting me in and indulge. And, uh, <laughs> one last thing, I do a lot of public speaking, and one of the things I learned is the Gettysburg Address Rule. And anybody who does public speaking, remember this. The guy before Lincoln spoke for two hours, and no one remembered a word. <laughs> Lincoln spoke for less than two minutes, and it's the greatest speech in American history. So sometimes a short presentation is a lot better than a long one. So thank you for letting me have a few minutes of your time. Thank you. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, hymn 408. 408. Oh, God.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.